Welcome everybody to our sound for video sessions. Good to be here. Got to switch my headphones. <laughs> I'm really happy to invite Mr. Michael Pedersen back. Michael, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, my mistake. I have you muted. Michael, my mistake. You're no, no unmuted problem. now. <laughs> How about now? Anyways, uh, thanks, thanks, Curtis. Always good to be here and glad to talk to you today. All right. Well, for those that uh, missed our, Michael's actually, this is your third time coming on the live stream here. I believe so. Yep. And for those that missed the previous ones, let me just give you a tiny background. Michael has been with Shore for a couple of years um, <laughs> uh, and has filled a variety of different roles at Shore, is currently the historian for Shore. So, Michael, you could probably give a better bio than, than I can. Why don't you go ahead and Tell us about your history there. I, I started at Sure in 1976, so I'm in the year 47 now. Uh, started out in sales, didn't really like sales, liked the products. I became a product manager. Uh, I also was uh, did advanced product development for a while. And then I started our application engineering department in the early 90s. If any of you have ever called Sure and got help from an application engineering department. That was the department I came up with because we didn't have anybody at the time. You would call into Sure and you might talk to anybody. I said, well, we need to centralize that. Yeah. So I did that. And then uh, it was around 2016 where uh, Sure's president said, with all the history you've got, you know, we really need a historian here to do webinars and do research and kind of be the spokesman for the company. And I said, love to. Uh, and also I kind of promised Mrs. Sure that I would do that as well. So uh, I've been doing it since uh, 2016, and it's great. It's the most fun I've ever had. That sounds like a dream job, actually. It is. It is. <laughs> well, I, for the occasion, I'm using my Shure SM57 today. Thank because, you, Curtis. I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> today, we're going to talk about, uh, so just for history, if, if anyone wants to go back, uh, when Michael first came on, talked about the Shure SM7 and its history, which is actually a fascinating history, and then... Last time talked about the lost lab notebooks of Ben Bauer, who mm. is the inventor of the Unidyne microphone capsule. So obviously that's still relevant in what we're going to talk about today. But today, uh, talk specifically about the Shure SM57, which is a microphone that has a long, rich history in a lot of applications. But one fascinating one is as the microphone for the White House, if I have that right. So That's correct. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to kind of talk us through that history. I'm dying All right. to hear more. I'll let me advance the slide and see if it works. Is that okay? Yep. Looks All good. right. So this, this first part here is this is, for, this is for legal. You need to understand that this is an educational and historical presentation, and the images I'm going to use are not an endorsement of our products. So when you see Franklin Delano Roosevelt with your microphone, it didn't mean he endorsed sure microphones. So I just have to say that for legal reasons. Uh, I had the honor and sometimes the headache of being Shure's liaison to the White House Communications Agency for over 20 years. I was there from 1987 to 2007, approximately. So White House Communications Agency, which is pronounced WACA, uh, is an agency of about 1,000 people, give or take, almost all of them the military, and they support the White House and the, you know, the president and the vice president and everybody associated with the White House for doing video and audio and film and photographs and so forth. So that's what their job is doing. But what I'd like to do before we get into that is just I want to review kind of the historical role of Shure microphones at the White House. So the first president to use a Shure microphone was FDR. And Shure started uh, making and selling our first microphones in 1932. And here actually is a photograph from Roosevelt in 1933, approximately, using a Shure model 11N carbon microphone. <clears throat> kind of what I like about this is there's a wooden handle that's screwed onto the microphone, and he's just grasping it there. And that's actually where the term handheld microphone comes from, was when they would put wooden handles on microphones back in the 30s. Presidents of the United States using our Unidyne 1 microphone, that's the Elvis mic. Here's FDR, or excuse me, here's Truman, who succeeded FDR. And of course, this is the famous uh, photo where the Chicago Daily Tribune did a headline that says, Dewey defeats Truman, and Truman had not been defeated. He had actually won. And Truman is holding this up there kind of as a joke and to poke fun at the Daily Tribune. And you can see at his right elbow, there is a sure Unidyne 1 microphone. He also used it in the White House. Uh, this is a photo from in the White House. And this is a Lear wire recorder that was manufactured for the Navy. For those of you who are too young, before there was tape, 
recording. There was wire recording where you actually recorded onto a magnetic wire. And here it is with a, a Shure Unidyne 1 microphone on the right, also with an S36 Shure stand on there. And interestingly enough, at this time, Shure made recording heads for wire recorders. And so this Lear wire recorder may have had a Shure head inside of it. I simply don't know. Here's Dwight D. Eisenhower, who served from 53 to 60. This actually his photo was taken before he was elected. But you can see there's one, two, three Unidyne microphones there. And the circular microphone closest to us, I've not been able to identify yet. I think it might be a Western Electric, but I'm not absolutely certain about that. Presidents of the United States using your Unidyne 2 microphone. That's the smaller version. And by the way, S stands for small. And the 55S, which we still make in a variation today, is 33% smaller than the original Elvis mic. Here's John Kennedy, served from 1961 to 63. Uh, and I just like this. Notice... The, on the microphone, there's a there's like a improvised windscreen. They've taped a piece of cheesecloth over it to make it the wind resistant. This gives you an idea of at the time, pretty much White, White House Communications Agency really didn't know what they were doing with audio. They were just trying different things. Again, re realize they're military people. They're trained in radio. They're not necessarily trained in audio video. Now, the Unidyne 3, so the big one was Unidyne 1, the small is Unidyne 2, and the Unidyne 3 came out in 1959. Here it is. It's the five, model 545, which we still make today. A uh, couple things to notice. Notice, first of all, it has an Amphenol connector on the end, not an XLR. Uh, the, the X connector came out in the late 40s. The XL came out in the early 50s, and the XLR came out in the mid-50s. And It took a while to catch on. And this, it hadn't caught on yet, and so we used an Amphenol connector on this microphone. And also notice that the Unidyne 3 is an end fire design, meaning you speak into the end of the microphone, not into the side of it like you did with the Unidyne 1 and the Unidyne 2. So the 545 led to the SM57 a few years later. SM57 came out in, in 1965. What is the difference? When we go back there and you look, they look a lot the same, particularly the grills. Primary difference is... The SM57 is painted a dark color. It does not have an on-off switch on it, and it has an XLR connector. Other than that, it is a 545 inside. So presidential lecterns before the SM57 tended to be just a, I say, a cornucopia of microphones. Here's an example of Eisenhower there, and there's an Electrovoice microphone that's the Chrome one close, uh, closest to his left arm. Uh, the other microphones are RCAs, and there was really no rhyme or reason. Wherever they would went, they would put up microphones would be put up by local contractors, by local television stations, by local radio stations. It was pretty much a mess. So presidents of the United States that are using a Unidyne 3 mic. First was Lyndon B. Johnson. He served from 63 to 69. Here's his inaugural speech. Notice there are four SM56s there. Those are the, the SM57 and the SM56 are basically kissing cousins. The primary difference is the 56 has the stand adapter and vibration mount already part of it. It's like a pistol grip mic. Uh, and the 56 debuted a year before the SM57 did. The microphones here, interestingly enough, were provided by Bill Hanley. And that's a person that, if you don't know, he was the sound engineer at Woodstock in 1969. This is from a newsletter. October 1965, an internal Sure newsletter, and it said, Bob Carr, a guy I know and who actually mentored me at the beginning of my career, reports that we now have a separate professional line of SM microphone models. By the way, SM stood for studio microphones. And one of the models, the SM57, has been selected for use at all appearances of Lyndon G. B. Johnson. So they were installed in television studios and on the rostrum whenever Johnson would speak. Here's the television studio. You'll see there are two SM57s left and right. Why did they use two? Simply for redundancy. If one failed, they just wanted to have a backup ready to go. And here's a better shot of Johnson, uh, actually at the rostrum, getting ready to give a speech. Uh, the spaced out, the microphones left and right, was determined by a White House photographer, not by the audio people. The White House photographer just said, oh, this looks good. That's where we're going to put the microphones. Uh, of course, these SF57s have the A2WS locking windscreen on them, the, co the, the cone windscreen or the can-shaped windscreen. When Nixon took over, they put four microphones on Nixon. And this is honest to God's truth. 
Why? Because there was a military general in charge of Waka, and he said, if two mics were good enough for Johnson, then four mics will be twice as good for Nixon. Get me four mics for the president. That's the type of rationale there was back then. There really wasn't a lot. It was just like, oh, well, if one microphone sounds good, four is going to sound twice as good. Of course, we know that's not the case. So eventually, Schur advised Waka that the best thing to do was to put three microphones positioned in the middle of the lectern. And what this was, was one was used for public address, one was used for broadcasting, and one was using recording that would feed the National Archives or recordings, the tapes. Um, and if any failed, they could be easily switched around. They never had any failures, but that's why they did it like that. So here's the three mic setup. Uh, and note that the mics are so close together that there's no place to put windscreens on them. So this could only be used inside. Outside, you couldn't put any foam windscreens on it. There was no place to put them. There was just simply not enough room. Uh, when Ford took over after Nixon resigned, they still used that custom mount. And that custom mount was fabricated by Shure for Waka. We didn't sell it to anybody else. It was only a Waka piece. When Carter took over in 1977, we varied the triple mount at the request of Waka, and we widened it out so now they could put on three A2WS, A2WS windscreens. And you can see there that he was outside. Maybe, maybe he's in sore side. I really can't tell. But no matter what, there was now room to put windscreens on if needed. Here's an example of Carter again. This is the Camp David Accords from September 1978. And you have Anwar Sadat on the left, Jimmy Carter in the middle, and Menachem Begum on the right. And you can see that they each have two SM57s mounted one on top of the other with an A26M dual microphone holder. It's a microphone holder we still make. Uh, and again, the microphone was for PA. The second microphone was for broadcast because they were actually doing, at this time, um, a press conference. When Reagan took over, they were still using the triple mount. Here he is at the Berlin Wall. This is his famous Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall speech. And you can see the three SM57s there in a triangle and the A2WS windscreens on them. This Reagan was, uh, our, our microphones were also there when Reagan had his convenient lapses of memory. I, I kind of make a joke here. Now, where did I park the White House helicopter? Um, but we are, we are proud to say uh, and I say this with my tongue firmly in my cheek, that more lies have been heard through SM57s than any other microphones in the world. So when George Bush took over, he made his famous speech of no new taxes, a promise that he did not speak, keeping a, he, that he did not keep speaking of lies. But something happened during the Bush administration. Now, I was involved with WACA at the time. I came in at 87 which is right at the end of the Reagan administration uh, and went through just the beginning of the Obama administration. So during the George H.W. Bush administration, the number of SF-57 microphones was reduced from three to two because of the following incident, which is just basically shown on the photo. So I'm gonna show you the photo and I'm gonna explain what's going on. This photo, which you're gonna see here very soon, caused an international incident. Here's the Queen of England. So you can see Mr. Bush was a tall guy, 6'3", 6 6'4". 6 For every president that comes in, they rebuild the lecterns to match his height. So the queen was very short, 5'3", five, 5'4", five, or something like that. And this is the Rose Garden in Washington, D.C. at the White House. And when the queen was going to get up to talk, an aide was supposed to put a stool for her to stand on, and they forgot. And so she walks up. And all you see is the queen's hat, her eyeglasses, and three SF-57s where her mouth and her nose are supposed to be. Well, the British press was just furious about this. There was all kinds of things about the tabloids. Uh, some of them suggested she looked like the elephant man or appeared to be wearing a World War I gas mask. But no matter what, it was a big deal. Now, I was, let me, let me just check, oh yeah, well, let me check the next slide. So I was working for, with Waka at the time, and I remember that they called me up the next day, and they were just like, what are we going to do? This is awful, and so forth. And, you know, I know it wasn't the microphone's fault. Someone forgot to put the stool out. And I think I was just in a rather nasty mood that day or something. I said, well, let's do something simple. Why don't you just saw off the middle microphone? And I was being facetious. And yet, that's what they did. And here is Bill Clinton, the next president, 
with a triple mount with the middle portion sawed off. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is how our government solves problems. So that's how you went from three microphones to two microphones because of Queen Elizabeth and my suggesting that the middle microphone be sawed off. And of course, we're still using two microphones like that today. When George W. Bush came in, the son of George H. W. Bush, we had to modify the two mount. Let's go back for a second. If you look, Scary, if you go back and you look at Clinton, notice the microphones are held securely. There's a metal clamp that goes around and there's like a little white piece in there. That's simply a nylon piece that allows the microphones to slide in and out without being scratched. But there is no shock mounting involved in that. George H. W. George W. Bush comes in and he gets frustrated when he's talking and, and, and when people ask him questions and he starts pounding on the lectern. Well, with the this count set up, which they've been using for years, when you pound in the lectern, you hear a lot of that pounding. So in this case, Waka came to Sure and said, we need to come out with a double mount that's got some shock mounting in it. So we did this. We took our A55M, which are rubber-filled donuts, for lack of a better term, and mounted two of them on this, this Y-shape uh, mount, and that became the new mount for the White House. Um, you could pound it on it. You could barely hear it because of the, the microphones were floating in air, if you will. The VIP 55SM, very important person, 55 because that was the model number of the A55M and shock mount. So that's what we, you can buy them still like that. Um, some people call it the Mickey Mouse mount because it does kind of look like Mickey Mouse ears. When Mr. Obama took over, they continued using the same A50, uh, the shock mounted version of it. This is the shorter, uh, this is the lectern he will use where they're just setting it up very quickly. You'll notice there's water on them and it is raining. So it was windy and rainy. And when it is windy and rainy, they will replace the A2WS windscreens with the A81WS windscreens. These are the larger ones. They're about the size of a Nerf football. But they work extremely well. You can have wind noise up to maybe 40 miles an hour and hardly hear a thing. And, of course, they do a good job of keeping uh, water out of the microphones as well. When Trump took over, he wanted to have just one microphone. He likes to play with something. He likes to be close to the microphone. He works the microphone so closely that uh, we were really fortunate that it was a dynamic mic because a condenser microphone worked that closely will likely clip. But this is the setup he had. It was a single SM57 um, with a A2WS windscreen suspended from an A55 isolation mount on a black gooseneck. This is the setup that was used during Trump's time. And then when Biden came in, they went back to the dual mount. Uh, here he is outdoors with the large windscreens on as well. You may also notice if you watch Biden that uh, a lot of times he'll be using a wireless microphone now. Uh, why, did this, why does he do that? He feels more comfortable. He feels, he, he relaxes. He becomes less stiff when he's walking around with a wireless microphone. So that's the reason. Micro, the microphones for the lecterns are still live and, and still active. Uh, they'll, they'll pot up down if he uses the wireless microphone, but they, that's really just kind of a, a safety blanket for him. He just feels more comfortable with a wireless microphone. The wireless microphones are sure axiant systems. So that's a quick history of it. Why was the 57 chosen for the president of the United States? Well, there's a lot of reasons, and these are the reasons maybe you haven't thought of, but let's just go through them. Uh, POTUS stands for President of the United States. His PA microphone is going to be used in a lot of different environmental conditions. It could be indoors or outdoors. It could be very hot, could be very cold, very dry, very humid, no wind or high wind. And there's a physical abuse from packing and shipping. So based on decades of experience, the recommendation is that a moving coil dynamic microphone can be used when absolute reliability is demanded. Condenser microphones are valuable. Waka uses condenser microphones. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But they're better in a controlled environment, like inside the White House. Um, but they're not recommended when you have for critical applications where you have uncontrolled situations such as heat, humidity, wind, or precipitation, all being uncontrolled. Condenser microphones simply do not hold up as well. That we'll discuss why in just a second. So one of the re main reasons is something called mean time between failure. Uh, you can sub you can sub uh, use the word average time between failure, if you will, but MTPF is what's called that. And a condenser microphone, no matter who makes it, it's less reliable because it has lots more parts than a moving coil dynamic microphone. It's got a circuit board in it, for starters. 
And this associated preamplifier has lots of components in there, and all of them have their own rate of failure. Any one of those failures can cause a condenser mic to fail, be it ours or Sennheiser's or anybody's. All condenser microphones have this issue. So in brief, more parts, the more failure possibilities. The SM57 has fewer than 50 parts, and most of those are mechanical. Let's take a look at a service repair diagram here. Here is a service repair diagram for an SM57. You've got the cartridge here. The only moving part of the cartridge is the diaphragm. And during speech, that diaphragm moves millionths of an inch. You've got a transformer. Nothing moves in the transformer. You've got a connector. Nothing moves in the connector. And you've got wires. That's it. There's no electronic components in there as far as active electronic components. It's all passive. You've got a magnet. There's really very little to fail in there. And that's primarily the reason that SF57s are so reliable because there's just not a lot of parts in there. So here's the question I promised you, Curtis. And I, I, I don't have, I can't, uh, I'm looking at my entire screen here, so I can't see the chat. So I'll ask you to put in the questions. My question to the audience is, what's the mean time between failure for a Unidyne 3 SF57? And I'll give you a hint. It's more than one year. So just throw, throw, your, throw your question, throw your answers out there, and I'll wait about 30 seconds for your answers. Curtis is going to read a few of them to me. I'm going to take a drink of water, and then uh, I'll give you the answer. All right. That is fantastic. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and place a guess, too, but I'm going to give people some time here. Yep. There's a little bit of latency, so since we're live streaming, this yep, is probably no 10 or 15 seconds. Do you want, do you but, want um, a guess? Well, I'm going to guess... I am going to guess uh, mean time between failure. I'm going to say... 40 years. Okay. All right. Okay. So we have some others coming in. We have uh, 1,000. I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> um, we have 20 years. Okay. We have a guest for 35 years. Yeah. Uh, Matt Ruff says, I've had one over 25 years, so I guess at least 25. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, Matt. Thank you. Um, Samuli says, 100 years. Okay. Vincent Chen says, uh, heck, I've seen more abuse on SM58s and they keep coming up for more. So I give an <laughs> SM57 100 years. Uh -huh. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah, you yeah, go ahead. We, could, we got more. We got more. We got yeah, uh, 40, 40 years, 25 years, 34 years. Uh, oh, somebody guessed 34 years, 43 days, and 12.5 hours. <laughs> <laughs> our, he, so. our, Q, our QA department would like that answer. Yeah. Yeah, still going. 60 okay. years, 80 years, 85 years. Um, it's very flattering. Yeah, so that's, those are our guesses there. So okay. let's let's get the real answer. All right, here. so the real answer is 58.2 years, 510,000 wow. hours. Wow. So, and, and this is this is all done with, you know, we get products back, we look at when they were made and so forth. It's all done with a lot of calculations. I did not do the calculations. <clears throat> But you need to know that the Wireless Communications Agency has never experienced an SM57 failures. They've had them run over. They've had them left, stolen. They've had them you know, left behind. Uh, they've had cable failures, but they've never had a 57 failure since they started using them in 65, 1965. Um, the SM57 inventory they have is typically over 400 units. And in a typical year, about 10% of them are, repl are replaced or replenished. Um, you know, it's basically they lose them and they get scratched and so forth. But meantime, you know, 58.2 years, that's pretty good. So let's go on and see some other deciding factors. Let's talk about high humidity and high temperatures. Those two combinations of humidity and temperatures can cause condenser microphones of any brand to hiss, to pop, to crack, crackling. And the reason is what happens is that you get little tiny bits of moisture built up on the gold diaphragm because the diaphragm is mylar, has gold on it, and you get condensation on it, just like condensation happens on a cold glass of water during the summer. Uh, and when that happens, noise, sometimes it can actually stop working. Uh, also, the sound of the condenser can change with high humidities and high temperatures or have com complete failure. And any of those above are common with humidity levels above 95% and temperatures above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. But these conditions commonly occur in shipping and storage. Think about this. You've got microphones in the belly of a transport. It's minus 35 degrees up there. And then they land in Washington, D.C. in August on the tarmac, and they pull them out, and it's high humidity and 100 degrees. And condenser microphones, no matter who they are made by, just don't like that. Dynamic microphones, moving coil microphones, couldn't care less. Wind noise. 
The diaphragm of a condenser weighs about one one thousandth the mass of a dy dynamic moving coil assembly, one one thousandth. So since it's so much lighter, the diaphragm of a condenser is easily moved by the wind. That's why you gotta have large windscreens like Zeppelins for film sets. So this exceptionally large windscreen is necessary to cut down the noise. And because of the lightweight diaphragm in a, in a condenser, by the way, it's also more likely to pop from P words or large accelerations of breath. So a lot more breath noise with a condenser than with a dynamic microphone. Phantom power, of course, is required to operate a condenser microphone. <clears throat> now, it's very unlikely that phantom power can fail, but someone might switch it off on the mixer or forget to turn it back on or forget to turn it back on. So that could cause the microphone to not work. But a more likely problem is you get crackling and noise. Because remember, phantom power is DC current flowing in the mic cable. So if you have any bad cables or any loose or dirty connectors, the fact that that DC current is flowing in there can create audible noise. Though the same cable and connectors, bad connectors or alerted, you know, either bad cables or dirty connectors, will have absolutely no problem if it's a dy dynamic microphone and there's no phantom power flowing in the cable. So phantom power is great. But you got to have clean connectors, and you got to have really uh, tight connectors connections as well. Also, long-term performance. Performance characteristics of condenser microphones change substantially over time. A lot of different reasons for that. A new condenser mic can sound much different than an older one of the same model. Sometimes they sound better. People love old Neumanns from the 50s. But this fact that they all sound different makes it you have to have, if you wanted a bunch of microphones, you have a huge inventory of your condenser microphones, they'd all have to be about the same age to sound the same. And that's a difficult task when you have a large inventory of microphones. Dynamic moving coil microphones, on, on the other hand, remain very stable as they age and tend to sound nearly the same until they're retired from service, 58.2 years later. Other reasons the 57 is employed, uh, the matte finish does not reflect television lights or photographic flash. The dark gray finish tends to blend well with the lectern and also the dark clothing that POTUS usually wears. There's no on-off switch, so the mic cannot be accidentally switched off by POTUS or the staff. Uh, there's the locking windscreen. The A2WS can be locked in place with a set screw. You can get, get it in the right location and keep it there, keeping it at a proper distance from the mic diaphragm. There's the larger windscreen option of the A81WS, which can go over it if you need a higher, you know, a better pop protection or higher wind con con uh, con conditions. And worldwide availability. You can buy 57s pretty much at any retail store in an emergency. Now, this does not mean that Waka uses only the SM57. They have other microphones. For Microphones are tools, right? The 57 is versatile, but it can't fill every other role. So examples of other mic types that are employed in Waka for a variety of things, they have condenser lapel microphones primarily used with um, uh, wireless systems. For inside the White House, for example, if you see the White House press briefing room, you'll see some very small condenser microphones, lectern microphones that are used for speeches and for uh, people giving presentations. They use condenser shotgun microphones for doing some film work and uh, recording the president. They have moving coil dynamic mics like the 58 and the KSM-8 for musical performances at the White House. They have wireless mic systems for public address and music. Those are almost all, at the moment, Axiant Digital or ULXD Digital. And they have encrypted wireless mic systems for conferences. So they have, you know, they need a bunch of tools. Uh, the 57 they rely on every day, but there's a lot of other things they use as, as well. So in closing, and we're going to open this up to questions. It's been since 1965, the Unidyne 357 has captured the voices of U.S. politicians and international dignitaries worldwide. And next year, 2025, 2025 is going to be Schur's 100th anniversary. And we're proud to say that we've delivered the sounds of history and culture to the world for almost 100 years. So now I'm going to exit my presentation here so I can see people's faces like Curtis. And I'm happy to entertain questions. All right, Michael, thank you so much. I'm going to take a spin through the chat here. There have been some really great questions come along the way here. So let me just find there was one early on. Okay. I don't uh, I don't show you, the questions here. That's okay. okay. I'll just let you yeah. ask them. Yeah, just a second here. I don't know if you can answer this one or not, but what preamp or mixer have they used and how much gain is needed to get the clear voice sound they've always had over the decades? Um, they, they, they use a variety of them. Um, they've used uh, some Yamaha mixers. Uh, they've used some sound devices mixers. 
Uh, back in the 80s and the 90s, they use Sure FP mixers, FP32, FP33. How much gain you need? Eh, you probably need 60 dB, 60 dB gain, maybe 70 dB of gain to really do so. Yes, but good, good question. It changes. They, you know, they, they use things, but that's where that's where they're at now. Okay, very good. All right. Uh, and that was just a question. Incidentally, you just kind of already answered this one, but Vincent says, I have plenty of gain. He's wondering about, he has an SM5, or sorry, an SM7B already and is mm. wondering about adding 57s to his kit as well. Mm -hmm. Wanted to know how much gain. And They're pretty much the same element inside. So, yeah. you know, the, the only difference is that you can't get as close to the 7 element because it's set back. Um, where you get closer to the 57 element and therefore you don't, you know, so if you work it closer, you don't need as much gain. I don't, I don't know the GAP 75, 73 preamp. Sorry, Vincent. Don't know. That's, a, don't that's, know the, that's a golden age project. 70, it's like a Neve, uh, 1073 clone basically. Okay. Um, but it does have quite a bit of game. I, I have one of those as well. Um, so Vincent, just in my practical experience, I think I, with the SM7B, depending on the it depends on the voice. It depends on how close the person is to the microphone. But I generally have found that the SM7B requires like 60 to 65 dB, depending on the person. And the SM57, I generally find get away with like two to three, at least two to three dB less gain, just because the, the capsule's right up near the front. Right. And it seems I don't know if the transformer makes a difference as well, but I've just found I don't need quite as much gain. You no, know, the seven doesn't have a transformer in it. There's, right, know, right, right, right. Yeah, right. right. So yes, the, the 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 transformer in the fifty seven does give you some uh, output gain. Correct. A little bit more. Yeah. Yep. So good stuff there. Okay. Um, Shoji Production says I have owned an SM fifty seven windscreen with the set screw for over ten years. The foam is still in great shape. <laughs> How is that possible? So you, you take good care of your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That that is true. I mean, not not too much spit. I'm assuming Shoji, but that, that's this is the I don't know if it's the same one that you have. This yeah. is this is the um, the one with the set screw that holds right. the foam. Just to, you know, you can position it away from the grill so that you get that you know that, that diffusion area for the for any breath or wind that's coming through. Yeah, um, Fo foam is a constant pain in our butt because we, yeah. we we don't make it. We have to buy it, right? Yeah, and and we're really demanding company uh and so it has to be so many pores per inch you know and it has to go through all the environmental and so forth and there, there's some foam manufacturers that simply won't deal with us because we're you know they're, they're used to building they're making foam to go into packing cases uh yeah. and you can't do that so uh but yeah we, we try to get the best foam we can and eventually you know it, it's it, it's a petroleum product it breaks down because of sunlight and a lot of different reasons and so forth yeah. so but i'm glad it's been working for over 10 years and uh, you take good care of your stuff. That's the only thing I can figure out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, somebody mentioned, also mentions here, not so much a question, but XLR is sometimes mm. known as a Canon connector. Is yep. that a term you've heard as well? Yeah, of course it is. Because Canon was the company that created the X connector. Ah. So, uh, and by the way, so it came out as an X connector. Why was it an X? Well, guess what the previous product was? <laughs> UV, oh, it was a W. It was the W <laughs> connector. So they came out with the X connector, late late uh, 40s. Then they added a lock, the little latch, you know, so X, XL, L for, yeah. for latch or latching lock. And then the R was for the rubber boot that they put at the end of it for cable, uh, for the cable flex. So oh, XLR. Okay. And, Canon, have... and Canon created it. Interesting. Interesting. Yep. Okay. Is that Canon as in the company that makes printers and cameras? No, and... that, that was, that's one N. Let's see. This is C-A-N-N-O-N. -N -N, and the one got you're it. talking about is C-A-N-O-N. -N. Got, so got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. But yeah, it's still, I, I don't know, you know, they've been bought and sold, but they still exist. Okay. Yep. Uh, incidentally, uh, Matt Ruff was at the teardown. Wow. Last week. Yeah. That's pretty cool, man. <laughs> Mr. Were you Gorbachev, mixing? Tear down this wall. That was Ma great. Yeah. Matt, were, were I'm you impressed, Matt. You... Yeah, I know. And I want to know if he was the one mixing or... Did you, did you get a piece of wall? <laughs> <laughs> so cool. Um, yeah. All right. Let's see here. What were the original performance goals and designs criteria for the SM57? And what was the original use targets or use cases? Well, it, it, it's, it's a great question. And I, I, wish I, could give, I wish I could give you some really, really philosophical aspects of it. But there wasn't. They basically... So Bob Carr was a product manager of Sure at the time. And he was tasked with getting our microphones into more television and radio studios in the 1960s. Because at the time, RCA, Electric Voice, and AKG were the big microphone makers that were used in television and radio studios. So 
Bob says, okay, I'm going to design a whole bunch of products. And he was told that, no, you don't have a budget to do that. Because see, at the time, in the 1960s, Sure's primary business was hi-fi cartridges. Hi-fi cartridges, we couldn't make enough of them. They were very profitable. So microphones were, they were, they were in the back seat. Mm -hmm. So Bob was basically said, well, Bob, the only thing you can do is take existing products we've got and maybe repaint them and put some different things onto them and turn them into your SM line. So he took a 545. He took off the switch because you don't want to have a switch when you're on TV because someone can turn it off. He had it painted black because, or gray, I should say, so it didn't reflect um, uh, lights. He added the XLR connector because amphenols were not popular with TV and radio. Uh, and he made it balanced low impedance as opposed to high impedance or low impedance. So he took a 545, did all those things, turned it to the SM57 and said, here, <laughs> here here's your studio microphone. Uh, I, I there, there was nothing more than that. He had He worked with what he had. And then he had the 57 and he put a ball on it and then it became the SM58. So, you know, I mean, I, I know we're, we're far more scientific about it now, but that's that's really how it came about. And how do I know that? I knew Bob Carr and he told me the story. He said, I had no budget. I basically had to work with what we had. Yeah. And so yeah. if you go back and you look at a, a lot of those SM microphones from the 1960s, you will see in the standard line, which we sold to for like PA installations, same versions, different colors, a few different features. So wow. that was it. Sorry to disappoint you, but that's that's how that's how it came about. That's the real story. You heard it here. That's the real story. <laughs> All right. Here's another interesting one. Do you have the mean time before failure stats for the SM7? I don't. That, that's a great question. I, I'll have to ask the QA people to uh, to do that. But I could. I've got a SM7 from 1971, 1972 at home, uh, and yeah, still works. They, still they would going. probably be very very similar. What what would change it is that the switches. You know the the, yep. the switches like that. Those those would be those will bring it lower just because they can fail. Yep. Um, and what else might fail in there? Um, well, oh, no the, the wire, the, the wire yeah. that goes to the yoke. So those okay. things would probably lower lower the, the the years. Yeah, there's a there is a humbucking coil though, right? In the, right, in but the, that doesn't okay. move. That's okay. that's oh, that's okay. that's stationary. Got it. Got it. Got yeah. it. So okay. I would say that the switches and the cable going from the mic body to the yoke would cause the mean time to feel the failure be, to be less, fewer years than the SM57. But it's a good question. I'll ask them and see if they got some documentation on that. Good. Um, uh, this is a, an again a statement. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> the SM57 is a tank. It's hard to kill. There's always a joke at the venues that you know they use them as hammers, they use them as microphones, and they just <laughs> do both of them really well. Um, I don't know about the hammer part, to be honest. But the yeah, the, the the weakness of the 57 is the rotating grill yep. because that can that can pop off. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we've had we've had ways to fix that, but he, he, here's the thing, you know, I, I don't know if anybody remembers. Remember when Coca Cola brought out New Coke? And how everybody just like flipped out and new coke went away from it. When you've got something like the 58 or the 57, you just don't mess with it. Yeah. <laughs> You're better off making a new model altogether right. if you want yeah. to do something. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Here's another interesting uh, question here. Uh, any minor design changes to the SM57 over the years? Actually, actually quite, quite a few, but I, I, I can give you just generalizations on them. Um, because we don't release these things. They're trade secrets. And the primary reason, first of all, we don't want to tip off our competitors, right? Okay. Number one. Uh, but now today, it's counterfeit issue. Counterfeiters are just, I mean, they just, that's a huge problem for us. Yeah. Um, so um, a lot of it has, the, the actual acoustical way it works inside, the uniphase principle, pretty much the same. But there's been variations. For example, now we use laser welding instead of adhesives inside. Um, the mylar is improved in the diaphragm. Um, the magnets improved. It's not a necessarily stronger magnet, but it tends to stay at the at its charge rate for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. um, originally, we used to use wool inside of it for acoustical impedance, but wool absorbs moisture and so forth, and that would change. So now we use a, a, an artificial substances. So there's probably about I would guess maybe twenty or thirty things we've done over the years. None of them changed the sound. All of them make them easier to manufacture and make it more reliable. But okay. that, that's the type of stuff that we just never release because we just don't want our competitors to figure out what we've spent a lot of time figuring yeah. out. Of course. Good question, course. though. Yep. Yeah. That's 
Good one. Here's all, where the SM57 has been manufactured over the years. Um, it was manufactured in Evanston. Uh, I, that's where I'm at. I, I live in Evanston and I'm in Evanston right now. We, we manufactured that from 1965 to around 1985, I would guess. So 20 years there. Uh, we moved the manufacturing down to our Juarez, Mexico plant in 1985. By the way, one thing I want you to let us know is that though we have manufacturing in China and Mexico, they are sure owned facilities and they're sure employees. This is not contract. Aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, moving the manufacturing down to Mexico uh, it improved the quality. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, it, they, we, we have far higher quality now. And it's not only the manufacturing techniques, but it's also, again, laser welding versus adhesives and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and now um, I, I don't know if we're building them in our, in our Shuzhou China plant or not. I think they're primarily built in Juarez. Uh, okay. But they, we we might. Uh, we, yeah, you know, we probably do. In, in, we probably build them in Shuzhou now because we don't want to ever want to be, you know, what if we had a fire? In, in right. Juarez, for example, right. and, and not, now you can't get things. So we tend to build things in multiple places. Um, so, yes, they were in the United States. And by the way, the, the whole thing about, oh, they were better when they were built in the United States. Statistics just don't prove that to be true. Yeah, the, the, there's a that's a whole interesting discussion to have about manufacturing in the United States. Um, we've We made decisions a long number of years ago that a lot of the manufacturing expertise is not here in the United right. States anymore. It's in other parts of the world. Yes, it is. Yeah, that's true. Sure. I, I think that'll change eventually. I really do. I think. I think it. Yeah, I agree. I yeah. agree. Good question. Um, what's the optimal distance of the windscreen to the SM57? Oh, well, that's a good right? question. Like, if if you put the A2WS on there, you here's what people do wrong. They basically they take the windscreen and they flatten it out against the diaphragm. You do not want that. You want an airspace in there. Mm -hmm. You know, and I would say an airspace maybe you know maybe of an inch or so. Um, so put it against the diaphragm and then back it off and leave an airspace. Because what you want to happen is you want the puff of air to go through different impedances. So it hits the, the air itself, that's one impedance. Then it goes through the foam, that's a different impedance. And then there's the airspace, that's another impedance. And then there's the grill, and that's another impedance. So you, you, you want an airspace in there. No matter what windscreen you're using, you always want an airspace. So I would guess probably about an inch, but you can't have to do it by feel. I, I don't know. You're, you're, you look like you've got your set properly. Curtis, yeah, you look it's, like you it's it. got about, I would say, at least two centimeters between the yep. grill and yep. the but foam. You want that airspace. Good question. Yeah, yeah that's that's what's unique about this, I would say, about this foam as well, is that it has the plastic ring with a set screw, so you mm -hmm. can intentionally keep it away from the, the grill of the microphone. Right, and the plastic is ring is unique. there just so you don't, yeah, the plastic ring is just so you don't mar the, yep. the finish on the microphone. Yep. Exactly. Good question. So, yeah, good question and um, actually good design. That's actually a principle that carries across the Zeppelin covers that we talked about that you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. That same principle, like you're 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 letting you know the wind or whatever is going to hit that outer surface and it diffuses. Right. And then it hits you know there's an inner air and it's going to diffuse some more and then yep. it goes into the microphone and there's probably a little bit more you know the grill more diffusion. So it's yep. it's a it's a good good deal there. Yep. Okay. Indeed. There's one here. What is the history of the PG-48, Mike? Where did the design <laughs> need come from? Uh, so the, 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 the PG is just an entry-level microphone. Here, here's, the, here's the aspect you get into. Um, you know, as, as, our pro, as our company grows, and by the way, the company now, from when I started to now, it's 30 times larger than when I started. Just amazing. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Which year did you start again? 1976. 1976. Yeah, okay. 30 times bigger. I mean, literally, literally I, I was I was doing a tour the other day. I do tours uh, of of our building, uh, and there was a person there who I who I'd never met before. He said, "Oh, are you new here? No, I've been here for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> it just happens all the time." So, but but the, the PG was simply uh, an ability, something to bring in entry level stuff, so we we could think of things that were lower cost in the SM line. Um, so that when someone walked into the guitar center or Best Buy or something, they couldn't afford an SM product. They could get a sure product that we were proud to make and still was durable. Uh, and so I, I can't remember PG had a had a I can't remember perform, performance gear. That's what it stood. That's what it stood for. Performance gear. Uh, it was just an entry. It's an entry level product. They're pretty good, you know, um, but uh, the design need came from it was for to hit a price point. A price point that was below the SM, and so because we had S, we had PG, SM, and then like KSM. Oh no, no PG, SM, Beta, and then KSM. Right. So right. it was it was to hit a price point. Okay, good, good, good. 
All right. Um, this one, you may or may not be, again, not being a product person. I have two donut style shock mounts. I was surprised to find the two mic adapter mount is over $200. Why is it so expensive? We don't, we don't, we don't sell many of them the, the, and the parts are machined and they're just really expensive to machine. Yeah. So I, I would say that the, that the two mount, the two mic mount that uh, we, we sell the Waka to you, you know, maybe we sell 200 a year. And so when we go to our suppliers, they just charge us up. It's just, it's just a small, just not many of them sold. So yeah, not so a lot have, of, we, uh, if we, yeah. we sell 10,000 a year, 10,000 a year, they'd be far cheaper, but they're not. Yep. Yeah. Then you get the economies of scale and you, you, you know, probably yep. had more advanced manufacturing and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Makes yep. sense. Okay. Exactly. Um, this is not a question, but, uh, Vincent would like to, would like to work for sure. Just FYI. Vincent, <laughs> I, I tell you, man, it's, it's been a great career. I mean, I, check this out. I have 47 years there. I'm not number one in seniority yet. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. It's really, wow. uh, what, uh, the, the short version of it is that Mr. and Mrs. Schur, Mr. Schur ran the company, owned it from 1925 to 1995, 70 years. <clears throat> His wife owned it from 1995 to 2016 when she passed away. And then we were all kind of like, well, the Schurs are gone now. What's going to happen? Well, they had set something up. So when the company was in 2016, when Mrs. Schur passed away, the company was passed to a trust. All the people, all the people who work there are holders of the trust. But if you have a trust, you have to have a beneficiary of the trust. And so the beneficiary of the trust are charities. So we are a for-profit company that's run for the benefit of charity. I mean, come on. How cool is that? That is pretty cool. And that's yeah. probably why, that's another reason uh, <laughs> where there's probably plenty of demand. People want to work for sure, I'm it's sure. A, it's a, it's yeah. a, I, 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 lo I love to go to work. I literally yeah. do. It, it's filled with just really smart, interesting people, nice people. It's just, I mean, I, I, it was my first job out of college. I ended up in the greener side of the fence and I just stayed there. Just <laughs> but you're call. right, Vincent. It's a cool place, man. <laughs> Another one. Uh, are you still learning new vintage microphone information? Every day. Every day. Yep. Um, and, and here's where I'm learning some stuff. So we have an offsite storage facility. It's, it's not ours. There are these places called like Iron Mountain and places like that store yeah. these things, right? So about five years ago, <clears throat> our finance department said to me, uh, you know, we've been paying for offsite storage for 500 boxes since 1955. <laughs> I, I think we should throw all these boxes out. And I said, not without me looking at them. Yeah. And so every other month, myself and our librarian, Julie, and the archivist, we go out there and we look through boxes. So just... Last week, I was out there looking through boxes. Now, you, you, you get you can go through about eight boxes in about three hours. You know, and you look at one and you go, oh, man, this, these are invoices from 1960s. They gone. But then you find interesting things. So I found last week um, a binder from 1960 that was a review of all the wireless microphones being made in 1960. All these companies, I didn't know any of the names except for Sony. But in that same thing, I found the circuit diagram for our 1953 wireless transmitter, which used vacuum tubes. And I've never, wow. I've been looking for that circuit for 20 years. Wow. That Man, was last got, week. That was last just week. Last, just last week. It wow. was so exciting. So yes, the, um, a kid, that, that's what's fun about the job. There's, I could just never learn enough. So <laughs> I've got a, I got a list of great white whales and that crossed that one off. <laughs> oh, brilliant. That's, that's exciting. Yeah, well, it was exciting. There you go. Um, That's it. Yep. He's okay. So ITT the Canon. Yeah, company yep. we were talking about became ITT Canon. That is correct. Very That's, good, Rob. Okay, good. Uh, you got some smart people out there. This is cool. Well, well uh, it's, it's, it's the community. It's, uh, yep. You know, you got people are interested in sound and they're, they're smart. <laughs> yep. Yeah. We're um, not rich, is... but we are smart. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, that says cool. I was an intern. And yes, I got a piece of the wall for my dad who was in wow. World War II. Uh, wow, man, that is that, that is special. Yeah, that that is, is very cool. very special. Um, Vincent says SM58 was my first sure product I got to use. Was sold since I actually my, have my original. That's my I uh, I actually bought a condenser microphone first, but the first really microphone after that. Yeah, I would because I was recording at home. I mean, it was yep. indoors. It was it was fine. But um, SM58 was the, the second microphone I ever bought. Mine was a mine was a PE five eighty five PE was performance entertain 
professional entertainer, 585. It was a dynamic mic. I had a rock and roll band in, in the late 60s, and I needed a vocal mic. I was a background singer. And I remember yeah. buying that and it came with a little white, yellow, white a lunch bucket, plastic lunch bucket <laughs> carrying case, high impedance because you plugged it into your guitar amp, right? Yeah. yeah. On off switch. And uh, it was it was a it was a good microphone. And then I, I remember I went to, I went to college. I started college in 1970, and I loaned it to a friend of mine, mm -hmm. and a guy I'm still friends with, believe it or not. And and for somehow, and he broke it. I have no idea how he broke it, you know, because these <laughs> just don't break that easy. And I shipped it back to service. He said, "I'll pay for it." So we shipped it back to Sure for service, and it came back two weeks later, a brand new microphone with a bill for ten dollars, and I said. Wow, man! They got me a brand new microphone, and the repair was ten. What a cool company! And that's what, <laughs> and that's what got me caught. And then when I graduated college, I just said, you know, they were based in Illinois. I live in Illinois. Maybe I could go work there. And I, I literally walked in off the street and just said, you know, in, in kind of, "Hi, you need to hire me." I didn't say it that way, <laughs> but it turned out that at the right time. And two days later, I got a job offer and never left. So amazing! Yeah. Okay. Uh, there is another one here. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, not a question. Did dad use yep. sure record cartridges on his Gerard turntable way yep. back? So did I. My, my, first, my first one was an M91ED. We made turntables from, we made, say, we made phono products from 1937 to 2018. Uh, when I started at sure phono cartridges were 65% of our business. And when we got out of it in 2018, one half of 1% of our wow. business. Wow. Uh, and you know, and, and people say to you, oh yeah, but but vinyl is coming back. The truth is, in 1970, 500 million vinyl records were sold. 500 million. Last year, 35 million. You know, we'll we'll never get back into the business. It was great for 80 years. We we got out. We kind of like we did. We did like when when Mash went off the air. Mash went off the air when everybody still loved them, and that's what we yeah. did. We we got out of the photo <laughs> cartridge business when everybody still loved. Them. We still take grief for it, but. We'll never get back into it. We we, okay. we can't get good, we can't get good parts anymore. All our suppliers are gone. So yeah, yeah, that makes it tricky. Yeah. Um, okay, here's a little piece of feedback. Uh -oh. um, doesn't uh, Matt's not a fan of the little wire on the SM7? Yeah, you know, uh, it, it was yeah. it was always that. But but I got to tell you, Matt, um, we sell a hundred times more now than we did twenty years ago. So. Sorry, we're not going to we're not going to change it. <laughs> and the SM7 DB also has that wire, correct? Yeah, the new version. Yeah, okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I think. Again, I, mean, you, I think you, you don't want to you don't want to mess with it if it's exactly. selling well. You don't. You, you, you don't, don't, don't want to mess, mess with it. With it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. I. But I understand that it, that is that is a weak point of the design. Um, Robert asks, what's the best way to check that an SM57 or 58 is authentic? Well, buy, buying it from a, an authorized sure dealer, number one. If you've already got it, here's, a, here's the issue, Robert. We don't, we don't tell people how to tell the difference because then the counterfeiters know. That's the, that's the, you know once again, the bad guys screw it up for the rest of us. Yeah. Um, if you are ever suspicious, you can take some close-up photos, send it to info at sure.com, and we'll have one of the people who are experts on that tell you. But we won't tell you why. We'll just say yes or no. Um, I'm really sorry we have to be private like that, but the counterfeiters will pick up every last little thing, you know. They, they, they and and sometimes we'll do things in user guides and so forth that'll that they'll they'll miss, and that's another way we can tell. So, so buy from you know buy from authorized sure dealers, and if you're questionable about, about one, if if it seems too cheap, to, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Um, but info at sure.com, they can look at things, but again, they'll just tell you yes or no. They won't tell you why. Sorry. I think no. I think that's. I think it's not bad advice to buy from an authorized dealer generally. Anyway, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you if you if you you know if you're buying this because you're going to rely on it, having the authorized dealer also you know ensure that you yeah, get the yeah, yeah. warranty protection and so and our stuff is so heavily discounted. You know, you can look at B and H and Sweetwater and Full Compass. They're all going to be within a dollar of each other and yep. so forth. And so yep. look at those places to see what the price should be. And then if you see that a SM58 is a Hundred and ten dollars at all those places, and now you see one on eBay and you know, brand new for eighty five. No, something something wrong. Probably not. Yeah, something okay. wrong. Um, <laughs> got some some spicy questions here. What do you think about users trying to alter the sound in order to get an SM seven B audio quality on an SM fifty seven? I mean, like removing the transformers. That's one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're pretty stupid at sure. We don't know what we're doing. <laughs> don't do it. 
Don't <laughs> don't don't do it. Now, but, but you know, think about it. but this thing. Sound quality is subjective. If you go in and you remove the transformer on a fifty-seven or fifty-eight, and you think it sounds better, who am I to argue? Right. You know. But yeah. my, my suggestion is we've already thought all about all this stuff. You know, yeah. I, I I wouldn't do it. But again, if you, if you like the results, cool. I'm I'm not going to argue with you. I wouldn't yeah. do it. But it's um, some people say, oh, it's exact. Then it's exactly the same as an SM7B, no. but it's actually not. There's no, some no. some physics things that are different. First of all, the size of the body and the placement of the diaphragm, you know, the, behind the, that metal yeah, shield. The, the, the 57 diaphragm has a different compliance. It's it's looser. It's it's made of different mylar. Mm -hmm. uh, has more windings on it. There's a lot of different things that change. And of course, you have to. Keep, I always tell people, you a microphone. The moving part of the microphone moves millionths of an inch. It doesn't take much, yeah, <laughs> to make that thing sound different. Yeah. So, uh, I, I say, I guess for Paolo, I'll just say we're bemused. <laughs> <laughs> um, question: Where are things like Accent Digital manufactured? Same facilities. Uh, those uh, both in Juarez, uh, Mexico, and in Shuzhou, China. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, and Accent Digital is just. I, I gotta tell you, Ben. When I when I heard what we we're gonna do, I, I said, "No, we we can't do that." You'll never. I mean, the the things that it does as far as picking up frequency, you know, picking up interference and changing the frequency, it's it's astonishing to me. <clears throat> and one of the reasons, by the way, that none of our competitors have come up with anything like it, is that we designed many years ago a, a chip, a large chip that only we buy and only use and everything's done on that. So mm -hmm. it was one, one of our ways that we, so we could make that people couldn't reverse engineer it. Right. Uh, and that's a pretty special system too, by the way. I mean, it's just, it's, aston it's astonishing. We, we, I don't know if you, we won an Emmy award for it. I don't know if you know that or not. So that was yeah, pretty cool. It's <clears throat> well-deserved. Um, this is actually a question uh, is the same there when talking about the spacing between foam and the yeah. diaphragm capsule. Yes, <clears throat> the same thing does apply for shotgun yes. microphones as well. Yeah, the concept the concepts are the same. Yep. Exactly. Okay. Just a couple more here. Just you have just a couple more minutes here. Sure. I, I I'll go as long as you want, Curtis. It's up to you. <laughs> well, uh our manager here, Danny, um, is very insistent that we keep to time. So <laughs> okay. not a problem, man. <clears throat> Understood. Um, this is Shoji was very, just wants to express appreciation on a straightforward information from Michael. Thank you so much. Makes, uh, my sure products worth even more. Shoji, if, if you lie, you can't remember what you say. If you tell the truth, you always know what the answer is. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. All good. Um, what's the best way to check that? Uh, oh, we already, we already we, covered we, we that one. That. Yep. Yep. Um, let's see. I just want to make sure I've gotten everything <clears throat> here. And by the oh, way, I'm, you know, if people think of questions tomorrow or something like that, and you want to email me at Sure, that's I'm happy to do that. My email is very simple: Petter M at Sure. It's P E T T E R M. Petter M at Sure, and I'm happy to answer questions for you. Okay. Yep. Good. Um, I don't. I have not used. Uh, Robert's asking about Sure's know. beam steering microphones. I have not used those. Robert, I, when I, when they told me they're going to do it, I just said no. F physics, physics won't allow you to do that. These. Yeah. Of all the things I've seen over my years, it is the most stunning technology I've ever seen. It's I, I, I I'm I'm like, as you can tell, I'm speechless about, <laughs> about what, it, what it can do. It is truly amazing. Uh, I remember seeing the first beam forming microphone that Bell Labs made back in around 1989, and it was 20 feet long and curved, you know, because because you because of the wavelengths of sound, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then what we can do now with the beam steering mics for, for speech applications, truly, truly amazing. Um, truly amazing. Yeah, it's, I, 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 I literally thought it could not be done. And by the way, <clears throat> Ben Bauer, go back to Ben Bauer, right? Remember we did last time? In his 1938 lab notebooks, he had all the math for beam steering microphones. Interesting. <laughs> he had Interesting. figured it out, yeah, but, we, but none of the technology was there to do it. Yeah. Okay. Just here's here's a, this will be our last question. Yeah, I work, okay. with, I work with Total Neil Fights making podcast home studios usually badly. <laughs> <laughs> what would your default suggestion be for such a person? Let's say maybe for microphones. It's for it's for micro. You know, I mean, you know, SM an SM fifty seven with the large windscreen on it, the A two W the A eighty one bigger the one that you've got like that mm -hmm. is a pretty good substitute for an SM seven. SM seven is too you know it's too expensive i would yeah. i would do that a81 ws and the sm57 and 
go with it. That was the exact. Uh, so we made a video about that. Uh, oh, you did about a year ago, um, or maybe a little more than a year ago, and that was my conclusion as well. Is like if you're on a tight budget and you have to buy a bu- multiple and you're going to do a podcast, the big windshield and the SM57, and you should be good. And we did not clue about that ahead of time. I want you to nope. know we had not talked nope. about that. So. <laughs> In the same conclusions. Yep. Yep. All good. Okay. Well, Michael, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you here today. Thank you, sir. Um, hope, hopefully we can get a, have a chance to talk to you soon as you continue to learn more about the history of microphones. So got a, got a lot of it. There's, there's some good stuff about the early, early years of wireless are very interesting. Ooh, very that might interesting. be a good one. That might yeah. Be a hap- one. I, I got, I'm time. happy to talk about that. It's pretty cool. Okay. Good. Again, thanks so much. You're uh, thanks. Thanks so much to everyone else out there for joining us today. In the meantime, get out there and make some great sound and we'll talk to you all next week. Take care, everybody.